the word with you. So let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter three, title of our study today, Jesus and Moses. As we're walking together through the book of Hebrews, we discovered in our introductory study, and we looked last week again at the reality that the author wants to magnify Jesus in every possible way. So he's better than the angels. He's better than those they spoke to, better than everyone before him. And, and we're, we're walking our way through the Old Testament, if you will. And so we're going to see that Jesus is better than Moses, and he gives us so many good reasons without diminishing Moses at all. I really like that. There's something we can glean from it, and I'll uh, hopefully remember to share it with you. Moses, like Abraham, was venerated, loved by the children of Israel. Why? Well, Abraham, because he was the father of the faith, the five promises made to him in Genesis 12 gave them the foundation for the nation they became and the land they would inherit that they would, by the way, lose and then come back to and lose and then come back to. And then, well, listen, it happened over and over again and for the same reasons every time. So there's a lot to learn from studying through the Old Testament, lest we follow in their footsteps, lest we find ourselves guilty of the same sins that uh, took them out and did them in. Let's see, what did I want to say? No one except Moses, had such a radical testimony that the testimony of Moses is that he was born a slave and that there was a hit out on all the baby boys' lives. Pharaoh had gone full godfather and decided every little baby boy has to die because he was threatened because Israel had grown so strong and, he, and though they had enslaved them and were abusing them, they were concerned that somehow they would rise up. If an enemy came against them, they might rise up and join them. So he commands every parent to put their baby boys in the Nile. Now, what happens, and, and you should know this, that, that Moses' parents were people of faith. And they, they hid him after he was born for a couple months, I think three months. In any case, after the three, they're realizing, you know, you can only hide a baby so long. And so they decided to comply with Pharaoh's request, but with a slight addition. He didn't say we couldn't build an ark of bulrushes and put Moses in there. And that's what they decided to do. And just as Noah's ark saved a family, oh, this little ark made for Moses, it was going to save a nation, deliver them from bondage, the child within anyway. So they fashioned and formed this little ark of bulrushes and they put it into the water. They're in the Nile and it's reedy and stuff. So it's kind of floating gradually, I'm sure. And, and here's what I'm certain of, being a parent and a grandparent. These guys were walking by faith. They were acting in faith. They were praying, no doubt that God would show himself strong, that he would do something wonderful and miraculous to protect and preserve little Moses. And it just turns out, it just so happens, if you read the passage, that Pharaoh's daughter was down at the Nile bathing and she saw the, the, the little ark and, and, and sent her servant to go and gather it out. He, she brought it out and... and well, she opened it up and saw little Moses and, and he started to cry. Miriam, Moses' older sister, had been following to see what was going to happen. So she gets a really good idea. She goes up and says, hey, would you like me to find someone to nurse this baby for you? And she's like, oh, that'd be so great. And so she goes home and she says, mom, you're never going to believe it. And she's like, oh, I'll, I'll believe it. And, and, and she says, Pharaoh's daughter rescued Moses. And, and I don't know if they called him Moses back there. Moses means drawn out. He was given that name because he was drawn out of the water. But in any case, that little guy got to go home 
Mom got to nurse him, got to instruct him, got to encourage him, got to pray for him, not just from a distance, but right up close. And then when he was weaned, he went to live at the palace, in the palace of the same Pharaoh that had said all little baby boys need to die. So he's been rescued, he's been redeemed, he's been protected. Now he's going to be raised in all the knowledge of all of Egypt. And so it just shows that God is able to do just what he tells us he can do. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all, we could ask or think. I don't know what they were praying or I know they were people of faith though. And here's how I know. They're listed along with Abel and Enoch and Noah, along with with, um, Abe and Sarah, along with Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Moses' parents are listed in the heroes of faith chapter. That's Hebrews chapter 11. And you don't have to wait. Don't do it now, though. Stay with me. But you don't have to to wait till we get to Hebrews 11 to read Hebrews 11. And I'd encourage you to read up to, read Hebrews 11 and then read the rest because you're most of the way there when you get there. Why? Because the more familiar you are with these chapters, when we get to them, the more you'll get out of them. The more questions will be answered. The more, the more application will make sense to you. So in any case, what our author's going to do is, as he will throughout the book, is compare Jesus to everyone. He compared Jesus to the angels. Of course, he's way better than them because he made them. They were created by him and for him, they once all of them worshiped him. All of them till Lucifer, Satan fell and many rebelled with him. But they were created by him. So of course he's greater than them. And, and, and in this chapter, he's going to get to Moses. Therefore, he begins in light of things that have proceeded and always good to go back. And I'm not going to always walk you back. You can just go back and look, prepare yourself, read up to here, then read further on. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus who was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was faithful in all his house. He calls them holy brethren. Those two words together only appear once in the New Testament. Quick quiz, where might that be? Yeah, I mean, if you can't get that right, you really need help. It's right here. If it only appears once and we just read it, come on. It's common sense, right? or as we like to say today, uncommon sense, since there's so little of it. But not among you, not picking on you. I'm happy to see you and grateful for a chance to invest in you, to see God's word planted in your hearts and minds, knowing it will bring forth abundant fruit. Well, anyway, holy brethren, the word holy is 219 times in scripture. Brethren, 343. So those are real common words. But holy brethren, only here. Why? Because it's suggesting something that isn't inherent to man. We aren't inherently holy. We're made holy by the only one who is holy inherently, and that's Jesus. All of our holiness, all of our righteousness, all of every good thing in us, it comes from and is a result of trusting in and surrendering our lives to him. So in any case, we are told we are partakers of a heavenly calling, the heavenly calling. And that word partakers means partners, fellow workers, called to walk with him in holiness. And as a holy people, Because he says so, we must walk in holiness. Why? God knows that we've surrendered our lives to him. And if you haven't, he knows you haven't. I'll give you an opportunity to do that today. It's Communion Sunday. I'd love for this to be the first time you shared in communion as a believer, blood bought and and washed and cleansed and and adopted into the family of God. All of that will happen toward the end of the service. So stay with me all the way through it. And God's going to do a radical thing in you as a result of it. Well, 
we must walk in holiness because people can't see what God sees. They don't read our minds. Some of you who are married think you can read your spouse's mind. Guess what? You can't. How do I know? Pam thinks she can read mine. And if she could, she'd be even more upset. So the, the bottom line here is that, that people can't see the good in us, the holiness in us. They can only see our actions and observe, observe them. They can only hear our words and, and watch our expressions. They know people learn about others in those various ways. Some people are real intuitive. My, my older grandson, even when he was like just the tiniest type, he, he would be looking at one of those little Bible books that we had, you know, the Bible stories, and he goes, why is that guy so mean? Because they drew him mean. But, but he recognized seeing it. And guess what? People see that in us. They see us and they're like, why is that guy so mean? Anyway, hopefully they're not saying that about you. And if they are, repent today so they won't have a reason to. Well, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 6, I'll read you a couple verses here from there. Because it, it, it has to do with, well, this reality. He says, what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Back in the 70s and the 80s, when the Jesus movement was happening, and many of you are familiar with it now, that didn't know about it back then, we were called Jesus people. I love that. That's why it was the Jesus movement, the Jesus revolution. It wasn't a religious thing as much as it was a righteous thing. We used to use that word for everything though. Man, that was righteous stuff or that's a righteous this or that. But righteousness is imparted like holiness to us. And the only real righteousness is that which he has imparted to us. So he says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Listen, we are the children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. And those relationships are forever. Where we have relationships now that are temporal, but that relationship in Christ, it is forever. There's another reason we have no accord or part or agreement with those who are unbelievers. We can still love unbelievers because we used to be them. We can still reach out to them because we know what it is to be dead in trespasses and sin. We can and we should, but you need to know as far as partnering with an unbeliever, they're rowing downstream. They're just going with the flow. We're rolling upstream, which is much harder, going against the flow. And here's what I've learned. You can't be going two separate directions at once. And he's saying the unbeliever is going one direction and you're going another. So you have no actual fellowship with them. He calls our Lord in that first verse, the apostle and a high priest, and, and so both are apostle, high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Apostle is an ambassador, a messenger, uh, like those Jesus chose. He chose the 12 and he sent them out to represent him, just as the Father sent Jesus to represent him. And Jesus, we've learned, is the exact representation of the Father. When we're looking at Jesus and listening to Jesus and learning from Jesus, he says stuff like, listen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? He tells the woman at the well, God is spirit, and he means the Father. Spirit is Holy Spirit, Spirit, Father is spirit. When he uses the word God, since he's God the Son and the Son of God, he's always talking about the Father. And he says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he's an apostle, Jesus is, as he's an ambassador, a messenger sent by the Father, not just with words from the Father, but a revelation of the Father. 
He's the high priest as well of our faith. And we're going to see that, well, the high priest in Israel was a generational thing. The high priest was the only one that could offer sacrifice on the Day of Atonement in the Holy of Holies. If you're unfamiliar with all that, you just need to start reading through the Old Testament. We're about to finish Leviticus, and I'm grateful for that because the book of Numbers is next. So many great stories in it, and I'm, I'm a fan of Bible stories. We can glean doctrine from them. We can find age-abiding principles in them. But the most important thing is that they're there to teach us and they do just that. Well, in any case, there was only one high priest at a time in Israel, but Jesus is the ultimate and only true high priest because the high priest ministered in a tabernacle and later in a temple that were modeled after the throne of God in heaven. And so he could go only where, where only he could go, where no man had gone before the first time he went in, and he could uh, offer blood for himself there on the, over the tabernacle on the mercy seat where the Ten Commandments rested within. He offered first for himself and then for the people. But that had to happen year after year after year after year. And we're not on the high priest today because we can get to chapter 5. It'll be all about him. Jesus and the high priest. And then there'll be chapter seven, same deal. And then chapter nine. So I'm gonna have to pick which one of those will major on that and which ones, well, we can just use it as reference points. But important to say that, that these guys loved Aaron. Well, they loved Abe first and they loved Aaron, but they loved Moses the most. And one of the things that's so important is that they didn't, well, they didn't lose any appreciation of Moses when they trusted in Jesus as Lord. And our author is one of them. This is important. So he doesn't set out to minimize Moses in order to exalt Jesus. He chooses instead to show honor to both. And that's important because he was talking to two different kinds of people. He was talking to Gentiles who had no background in the um, Old Testament, but they had become believers in Jesus Christ. So they're born again of his spirit, adopted into his family, and they are forever going to be believers in Christ. We're going to get to meet and fellowship with them someday. And, and, and so then there were those who raised under the law, under Judaism. And, and so they had a whole different orientation. The Gentiles, they were always in danger of going back to the licentious lives they led before they gave themselves to Christ. They were always tempted and, and warned not to go back. So there'll be a warning here not to turn back, not to go back. And for them, it means something different than the Jews because the Jews were less tempted to go back to their lifestyle of sin as they were to go back to the law itself. Now, some were idolaters. We're going to see that today. So that is a sin, and it's the worst of sins because it's an affront to the creator of all things and the God who loves us and so loved us, he sent his son Jesus to suffer and die in our place and for our sins. So in any case, they were in danger, and we saw this in the book of Galatians, and we've seen it in others. They were in danger of returning to the law. But at this point, that the illustrations he'll use won't be going back to the law. It will be going back to Egypt, which is even more crazy because the law had done its job if they'd come to Christ. It had convicted them of sin, shown them they needed a savior and that Jesus was the savior. Once you give your life to him, the law has served its purpose, still sets righteous standards. We can still use it in a, a good and lawful and righteous way, but it's not about the law once you're in Jesus. And I've said it many times, the standards higher, it's love, it's grace, it's a much higher standard than fear of what happens if I, you know, break the law. It's what happens if I break the Lord's heart because he loves us that much that he laid down his life for us. So high priest, and, and, and it's so important to get this as, as our author decides to show honor 
to Moses. Nobody can say, hey, this guy's anti-Moses, no, or anti-law. No, he's not. He's just somebody who sees both. Once he knows there's just one family there, the children of God. It doesn't matter Gentile or Jew because those things are no longer the issue when you're in Christ Jesus. So all of these point, well, to Jesus. And, and we're told in verse two, and I read it to you, both Jesus and Moses were faithful. Both received glory, but Jesus greater glory. For this one, verse three, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son after, excuse me, over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. He's saying to simplify it, the house testifies to the greatness of the builder who deserves and receives greater honor than the house itself. And there's more. Moses, we're told, was faithful as a servant in God's house. Jesus is the builder of the house. And that word house can and often is used as household. So he's not just talking about physical structure. He's talking about the people. Now you are the children of God. Now you are the household of God. The, the word for servant here, though, isn't the one we would expect. That would be doulos. That's what we're looking usually for. That's a servant by choice. Someone chosen by God to serve him who said, Lord, I want to serve you with all my heart and all my life. But the word here is therapon. And we get our word therapy from it. Physical therapy or psychotherapy or whatever therapy you're in need of. And, and I love the word because it comes from two words that, that would read affectionate physician. I love that because Christ is definitely that. He's the great physician and he has affection for us. He loves on us. He cares for us. He's everything to us. So he says, Moses was faithful as a servant in God's house. Christ, a faithful servant over his own house. Why? Because Jesus is God the Son and the Son of God. I like it. And then, then he says, who hold fast and hold firm. We're his house. We're his household. He indwells us. He'll later say we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And well, we saw it back in 1 Corinthians. And, and he says, don't defile the temple because God's not going to take that lightly. So in, in any case, um, when he speaks of Moses, Moses was a servant and he was faithful, but what Moses wasn't was perfect. Jesus was a servant and he was faithful, but he was and is perfect. There were those who walked with him, chosen by him, discipled by him, sent out for him, empowered to do works like the works he'd been doing, the miraculous works. And listen, Judas was among them. They were sent out two by two. He must have been empowered supernaturally to do the very things he was sent to do. And yet for all that, he never really committed his life to Jesus. How do we know? Because Jesus calls him a son of perdition. That's not a term he would use for any of you who are in Christ Jesus. Son of perdition, that's son of the evil one. And, and well, he, he says to the religious leaders at one time, you're of your father, the devil. That's not how to win friends and gain influence, right? That book's never been written and won't be. But, but he told the truth. Was he angry when he said it? He wasn't saying it out of anger. He was just stating a fact. Did he know that Judas was a fraud? that he wasn't really submitted to him? Absolutely. And if you go on that head trip, well, how could he use a guy like that? 
You haven't watched much TV, have you? He uses all sorts of people. And, and that we're not in the position to say, well, that guy's not right on, so that guy's not even a believer. Or that guy is right on, so he's definitely a believer. Do you know there's only one person that sees the heart? Again, that's God. Everybody else, they're trying to figure it out, but it's, it's a lose-lose situation. We're never going to figure it out and don't need to. We can tell, though, if somebody's t- saying something that's not true, we should tell people, you probably don't want to listen to that guy. If somebody's living a lifestyle that's abhorrent to God, it's easy to say, you know, God hates that, so it doesn't matter how many people in culture embrace it, it's still sin to him. And if you care about people caught up in things that, well, you could never see coming, then you should be kind to them and and loving toward them. But you need to speak the truth to them. Speak the truth in love. Well, in any case, when Jesus first sends his disciples out two by two, he sent them not to the Gentiles, not to the Samaritans, but to the lost sheep, of the house of Israel. That's why I bring it up because he's saying God's built this house and and he was bringing his people in. Why? Because they were looking for, waiting on, praying for the Messiah to come. And Jesus is that Messiah. Jesus is that savior. Sadly, in um, verse Chapter 10, verse 36, we, we read at one point that a man's enemies will be those of his own household. That, that's a pretty sad situation. It's actually Matthew 10, 6, or, or, and then um, Matthew 10, 36. So the first is him sending them out. The second has to do with uh, there being enemies in the household. Judas was that in the household of that group that first Uh, ministered for Jesus. Therefore, he says, using that word again and again and again, verse seven, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial, in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Today, if you hear his voice, listen, come to me, all you who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart. And and again, and you will find rest for your soul. Those are Jesus' words for those of you. And, And as the Holy Spirit says, listen, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit Neither of them, none of the three would ever contradict the others. And so he's saying, listen, here's a word from the Holy Spirit. It was for them, but but get this, first century, 21st century, what's the difference? It's an easy one, 20 centuries. But, But as the Holy Spirit says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry, grieved with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they've not known my ways. He's saying, don't follow in the footsteps who've gone before you, who rebelled, who sinned, who died. They would do a 40 year, almost 40 year death march through the wilderness of sin because over and over and over and again, over again, they tested the Lord, they doubted the Lord, they accused Moses and the Lord. Some of the tests make sense to us. They got hungry. You know, you're out in the wilderness with a million plus, you know, you're going to get hungry. And you're like, where are we going to get food? And God wasn't upset with that. He gave them manna from heaven. Perfect nourishment, perfect sustenance, perfect everything, all they needed to survive. They end up saying at one point, our soul loathes this worthless manna. You got to know they didn't get out of there alive. God will not put up with that kind of a thing. So, so he's saying, look back and see what they did. They were thirsty and he gave them water from the rock. And we're told that the rock that followed them, because it's an image that's good to get in your head, 
the, the, the rock followed them from place to place. When they needed water, the very first time they needed it, God said, hey, go strike the rock and water will gush forth. All they needed, manna from heaven, water from the rock. And we're told that rock that followed them through the wilderness was Christ. That rock was Jesus. So in any case, he was angry. He was grieved with that generation. But here's the good news. Though he, though he disciplined them to the death, and they, it took 40 years to kill them off because he didn't want to kill them all at once. He wanted another generation to rise up. But the whole generation of military age that were delivered from Egypt died in the wilderness of sin, except for two men. Their names are Caleb and Joshua. And we're going to get to see that, well, and this should surprise no one, Jesus is greater than Joshua. So anyway, that's just ahead. He was angry and he destroyed a generation, but he was faithful to the next. Why? Because God always keeps all his promises. When he says, they've not known my ways, it's, it's a form of a word, gnosis or gnosko. It means an experiential knowledge. They never got to experience all God purposed and planned for the children of Israel on their short journey to the promised land because so many sinned against them. In Numbers 14, 3, and that's our next book on Wednesday night, we complete Exit, I mean, we completed Exodus, we completed Genesis, we complete Leviticus this Wednesday, and then we'll be in Numbers. But listen, Numbers 14, 3 says, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should be victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's select the leader and return to Egypt. That's so insane. They're like, what, what, he brought us out here to kill us? That makes no sense. And, and, and they decide they want to go back to Egypt. And for us, Egypt becomes a type of the world or the lifestyle we led before we surrendered our lives to Christ. That wasn't a good lifestyle or we wouldn't have asked forgiveness for it and, and for power over it. We've come out from our own Egyptian experience because we were slaves to sin. They were slaves to the Egyptians. We were slaves to our own stupidity and sin. So God says in verse 11, along all those lines, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Canaan was a land flowing with milk and honey. Rest was promised to them, but not all would inherit their inheritance. And again, unbelief isn't just someone's opinion. You know, this whole, you've got your truth and I have my truth. That's where it started. Once you start saying there's, that could be true and that could be true, but they're clearly both can't be true. Once people start saying, oh, but they can then they're lost. They're just revealing that they're completely lost and in need of help. And so we pray that God would open ears and, and soften hearts and that the truth would penetrate those hearts and produce the fruit that only the truth can produce. So those who just say, well, that's just your opinion. It is a deadly response to God's revelation and revealed will. God freed them from Bondage in Egypt and a whole generation died in the wilderness of sin. Hebrews 3.12 warns any and all who read or hear not to follow in their ways. We learned early on drifting from the word will lead to doubting the word. And that's why he's going to say like, hey, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Because when we're together, we're in the word. But if you rely on one meal a week and this is it, you're going to be weak. And, you know, it, it spiritually. And so you need to know that if you drift from the word, you will begin to doubt the word. And sadly, most of us know at least someone my position, 39 years here, I've met a few, more than a few people who once professed Jesus and were powerful witnesses for him, at least outwardly, 
Only he sees the heart. Only he knows if they're backslidden and going to come back to him or if they're apostates like Judas. Only God can see that. But we've learned drifting from the word leads to doubting the word. So, so many people who once said, oh, I believe Jesus. Everything Jesus said about himself was true. Everything the Bible said about him is true that he was born miraculously, that he lived sinlessly, that he died vicariously, that he rose victoriously. I know people who used to affirm all four of those that today will say, well, I just, you know what? I just, I just don't understand. And they'll say the same thing that someone who never believed or heard would say, how God could punish all those good people out there. Or what about all those other religions? Listen, don't let that happen to you. Drifting leads to doubting. Doubting leads to departing from the word, going back to the old life, to the old ways, to the old sins. God calls it an evil heart of unbelief, an unbelieving heart. And we're told a man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. This is so important. This is an evil in the abstract. Because, you know, not everybody even uses the word. The Bible uses it a lot. But there are many things that are just flat out evil in our culture, in our city, in our state, in our country, in our world. But this isn't evil in the, the abstract. It's active opposition to good, to, to, to God. Satan, the evil one, and, and this word is used of him, um, He's, he's, he's the one who, you know, well, pulls people away by questioning the word, asking, you know, did God say, and does that really mean what it, what it, you think it means or what they told you it means? Listen, Satan is a liar. He's a tempter. He's an accuser of the brethren. He's so much more. But, but he's not even going to end up in the list here to say God's greater than him. Jesus is greater than Satan because Satan isn't even as great as the other angels. He's a fallen angel, a rebellious angel, one who's headed to an eternity in outer darkness. So in any case, we go ahead and look ahead. Um, Exhort one another daily, verse 13, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. He's saying, don't let yourself drift, doubt, and depart because you'll end up in a state worse than the one you were in when you first said you understood, when you first claimed to believe. And, and they knew how God dealt with Pharaoh and their unbelieving ancestors. He's saying, don't be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Do you know that, that it does say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and some people jump on that. Look at that. God actually did that. No, Pharaoh hardened his heart against God. And it's a different word when it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh's hardening of his heart was a refusal to hear and acknowledge and obey the Lord. God was just ratifying his decision to rebel against him. And he can do that. He can, he can say, hey, you don't want to walk in obedience? Let me show you a couple things. Pharaoh hardens his heart post blood, post frogs, post lies and flies, pestilence. And did I say flies or flies? Well, anyway, they're both words, I guess. But it's lice and flies I tried to combine them. I get it. I, I, you know, pestilence, boils, and hail. After each of those, after saying, okay, okay, uncle, I give, you know, he taps out. And then, and then he's just like, well, I was just kidding. But, but listen, he's saying, don't let you yourself be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. For some, it sounds like a condition, like if you'll do this, then God will save you. That's not a condition, it's a proof. He's just saying, if he saved you, you're going to continue to walk with him, to serve him, to grow in him, to be a rep for him. The mixed multitude like Judas, they were with them, 
but they weren't with God. Verse 15 says, while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion for those who heard, those who having heard rebelled, indeed, it was not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses, not all at once, but over time, group by group by group, family by family by family, they stopped trusting and they started rebelling and they died in the wilderness of sin. Verse 17 says, now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. That rest, by the way, would be the promised land. It was milk and honey. It was rest from all their weariness. They were no longer slaves to, to uh, the Egyptians or slaves to their own sin. They were servants of God and his blessing was on them. But not all entered in. Most, well, all of that older generation died in the wilderness of sin. So we could see they could not enter in because of unbelief. And by the way, there's no such thing as I can't believe in a God like that. I hear that and that's not true. You might not believe and you might choose not to ever believe, but there's no such thing as can't believe. You have every reason to believe in him because every idea that men have come with about how we got here in the first place if it doesn't begin within the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Whatever, whatever they're thinking, if it doesn't have that in it first, they're going to be wrong. So in any case, with whom was he angry 40 years? Verse 17, was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness, I know I read it. I wanted to end on it. To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. I want to read you something from John 10, just a few verses. It's John 10, 22 on a little bit. It was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. It was written, uh, or it was winter, excuse me, and maybe I should keep those on. And it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple, thought I'd memorized it, just shows you, I haven't always done it. Uh, Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. The Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered and said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. But if you do not believe, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. And this is a beautiful picture because Jesus is saying, I got you and the father's got you and he's got you and you're safe in the hands of the father and son. And how did they respond that day when Jesus said these magnificent things to them, revealing himself completely? They took up stones to stone him. So let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? Do you believe all things were created by him, that he was born miraculously, that he lived sinlessly, died vicariously and, and rose victoriously? If you do believe those things and you haven't given your life to Jesus, what's the matter you? Why are you not surrendering to him? And if you don't believe in him, let me encourage you. Read the word. He can open your eyes. He can transform and change your heart. And only he can do those things. But if you're ready today, as we prepare our hearts to worship once more and share in communion today, if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus and the lights have gone on, you understand it. You, you realize this has to be true. He has to be the way, the truth, and the life. He has to be the resurrection and the life. He has to be who he claimed to be. 
Because why would he suffer and die as he did for my sins if he wasn't? And why would the disciples, one after another, after another and another, die as martyrs for a, a, a Messiah they didn't know to be the Messiah? Listen, if you need to give your life to the Lord Jesus, it's this simple. You need to confess that you're a guilty sinner. I'll pray a prayer. You can pray it after me. But, but before we do that, I just want you to say, hey, pastor, I do want to pray that prayer. Why do I want to see your hand and, and have you catch my eye? Because I want you to acknowledge first, hey, I'm going to do that. It's a huge step because you're, you're, you're making the most important decision you're ever going to make. You either believe Christ died for your sins according to the scripture. He was buried and rose again according to the scriptures and that there's life everlasting in him. Transformation in him. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of heavenly lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. And Jesus is the ultimate gift to us from the father. Anyone right now, you need to give your life to Jesus. Raise your hand. Hold it high. Look up and catch my eye. Anyone this hour? Anyone this service? Lord, I want to pray for any and all who were in the valley of decision. And we know how the enemy works, Lord. He'll whisper in our ears. And especially in a person in that position and place yeah you don't have to believe that just believe something just be a good person just try harder do better jesus said if you don't believe i am you will die in your sins i want you to live forever and i want you to be a part of him and a part of us so if you need to give your life to him, I want you to pray, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You can pray those words aloud and, and, and anybody wants, maybe overflow, maybe in the cafe, maybe logged on or listening in. Maybe a week from now, somebody's gonna catch this and, and gonna hear, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm guilty, you're holy. I'm separated from you, not because of all that's happened to me, but the things I've done and fail to do. And I want the life only you can impart. I want, I want the life I see in the eyes of those I know who've given their lives to you and testified that reality to me. I want life everlasting, your gift, and life abundant for now, fruitful life that brings glory to you. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to surrender now and give your life to the Lord. And, and then I want you to share in communion with us. Communion is a family celebration. We're going to worship in a moment. Now I'm going to talk just about the bread and the cup. But I want to say that there are warnings in Scripture about partaking in an unworthy manner. And, and believers over the years have applied that to believers. But... It makes sense, actually, if you think about it, because he would be saying, well, don't take it in a superstitious or, or in a sacrilegious, <laughs> sacrilegious. Hey, can't even say that word. Don't take it in a way that would be, you know, defiling to you. Don't, don't play games with God, we might say. But if you're an unbeliever, it's my firm belief that unless you give your life to Jesus, you're going to die in your sins and forever be separated from him. So taking communion can't make your situation worse. But there's no reason to say, I believe in Jesus, and I believe that this, this bread represents his body and this, this cup, his blood, unless you believe in Jesus. So believers, don't do it in an unworthy manner. And unbelievers, give your life to the Lord and then take and partake. Let's worship together and then we're going to um, eat and drink together. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled. I 
died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him By heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name. hold in our hands the bread and the cup. And that fateful night, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he distributed it to those disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we understand. Had there been another way, you would have gone that way in the Father too. You prayed in the garden three times. If there's any other way, let this cup pass. But you weren't talking about the cup of communion. You were talking about the cup of suffering. The wrath of God poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. And so, Lord, you took the cup and you called it the cup of the new covenant in your blood. And we've been studying on Wednesdays the covenant you made with Moses and through Moses and with your people through Moses where blood was shed for, for the covering of sin but all the blood of bulls and goats ever shed we'll learn later in Hebrews never actually cleansed one's sin it just testified that they knew they were sinners and that they were wanting to be cleansed by you and that was enough to be accepted in that day You've raised the bar so far in going to the cross for us. So the bread we hold points us to the sacrifice you made. The, the cup we hold, the same thing. For you were bruised and wounded. You suffered and died for our sins. And we thank you with all that's in us that you would love such as us that you would forgive and transform and use such as us, that you've made us your forever family in Christ Jesus. And we thank you with all that's in us in his precious name, amen. Let's eat and drink together, you guys.